Paramedic Robert O'Donnell. That name may or may not sound familiar to you. It will probably sound familiar to you if I tell you that he was the first responder who pulled baby Jessica from the well in Midland, Texas in October 1987. In the years following the incident, paramedic Robert O'Donnell struggled. He struggled with depression. He struggled with alcohol. His marriage failed. Less than a decade later, in April 1995, paramedic Robert O'Donnell succumbed to suicide by a self-inflicted gunshot wound. He was unable to handle the pressure in the ensuing years after the incident in Midland, Texas, compounded by seeing the visual images of dead and dying children after the Oklahoma City bomb. The recovery phase of emergency management is roughly defined as a return to normalcy by the affected population. It can sometimes take weeks, it may take months, or it could even take years. Here in Houston, Texas, where I live, we are still recovering from Hurricane Harvey, which happened just over three years ago this month. The city of Houston and the surrounding area will still be recovering from Hurricane Harvey for at least the next decade. There is data out there that shows that first responders are affected disproportionately by the incidents that they are charged with tending to. Doctors commit suicide at twice the rate of the general population. In 2019, police officers committed suicide at twice the rate of those that were killed in the line of duty. First responders can suffer from a myriad of mental health issues. Depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and now a term we're coming to learn during the COVID-19 pandemic, compassion fatigue. The simple weight of an event that takes months and sometimes years in the making can weigh on the mental health of a first responder or a medical professional. For 20 years, I served in the United States Marine Corps. I was a jet aircraft pilot. We had a number of different tools to address our mental health during my time of service. First, as an example, we had both pre and post deployment mental health screenings. Before you went overseas, you were screened by a mental health professional. When you returned, you were screened again by a same group of mental health professionals. We were also screened six months after our return to give an overall picture of our mental health after having served overseas. One other tool we had at our disposal in aviation was something called the Human Factors Council. This was a collection of an aviation organization's leadership, and we discussed, for lack of a better way to put it, the private lives and the personal lives of the aviators in the organization. We could talk about things like a new baby, a move that was stressful, perhaps a death in the family, anything else that could weigh on the mental health of an aviator. And we could take action based on the meeting of that council to perhaps tell someone, why don't you sit out from flying for a few weeks until you can get right and safely operate an aircraft again. And that was not detrimental to that aviator. And while those tools might have been specific to what we did in the Marine Corps or in the military, there are common threads that need to go through into any effort to address the mental health of first responders. The first element is that it needs to be integrated. What are the resources that you have at your disposal to help address the mental wellness of first responders? It could be mental health professionals. It could be medical professionals, local clergy, whatever is available, bring it together and have it be integrated and able to address the myriad of mental health challenges that first responders face. The second thing is that it needs to be enduring. Like I said, here in Houston, we are still recovering from Hurricane Harvey, as well as other incidents that have happened beyond that. It may take years to address the mental wellness of first responders. Addressing it right after the incident is absolutely critical and needs to happen, but it also needs to provide for the well-being of first responders 
weeks, months, or even years beyond the incident. Finally, it needs to have the backing of leadership. It needs to be supported and have the full ownership to remove the stigma and to remove barriers that first responders may have to talking with mental health professionals about their mental well-being. As the example I gave about the Human Factors Council, it was the leadership that ran that organization, that ran that meeting. The same goes for any mental health or mental wellness program. The leadership, whatever it may be and whatever structure it may be in, needs to support and give full back to a mental wellness program. And finally, if you're in a position to help a first responder, one of the most critical things that you can do is just listen. We face this a number of times in the military, both during and coming back from overseas tours, both during my time here in, in Houston and Harris County after Hurricane Harvey, or a number of other issues that we dealt with where first responders were involved. We just took the time to listen. And that was a critical first step to helping. Because what you may do may help save the life of those that are charged with saving the lives of those in their local community or whatever it is they may be to help, to help those pull through any emergency or anything that they may face as part of emergency response. Thank you very much.